<laughs> well, today we have a very good panel. We have our lender panel this morning, and we are pleased to have four very educated, well-looking gentlemen and one very gorgeous woman. Uh, so I'm going to give them about 30 seconds to a minute to go ahead and introduce themselves, and tell them a little bit about themselves. Uh, let's go ahead and start with Peter. Go ahead. Hi. Hi, my name is Peter Chang from Guarantee Rate Affinity. Um, uh, I'm actually located here around St. Gabriel Valley area. Uh, Guarantee Rate Affinity is also part of Guarantee Rate Inc. Uh, combined with NRT, so most of our loans are within um, the co-op bank facilities. That's part of the NRT. So if you have any, any, any questions or if you're interested, please let me know. Okay, Rachel. Good morning, everyone. Rachel Ford with Security National Mortgage Company. Uh, we service over about 46 states. Our corporate office is in Las Vegas. We're also stationed in Utah as well. My office is in West Covina. Okay. Stephen? Good morning, Stephen Espinosa, New American Funding. I'm um, out of the city of industry. I have a little over 20 years in the business. We are in 48 states and have Right now, $30 billion in our portfolio, and we have 120,000 loans in service. Cosmo. Awesome, great. My name is Cosmo Sanchez. I'm a broker with NTMR. I've been in the mortgage industry for five years now, uh, born and raised here in Los Angeles. Thank you, guys. Let's go ahead and start the questioning. Uh, Peter, what makes direct lenders different from banks? Well, for those of you that uh, knew me from the past, uh, I came from the banking industry. I was with uh, banks for about 20, 17, 18 years. Total industry, industry of about 20. So, what are the difference? Uh, mainly, a lot of it goes with guidelines with overlays. Uh, the non-QM products, which are the non-qualified mortgage products. Definitely more choices to choose from. Uh, faster process. Um, Especially with uh, time frame like right now, where you know there's a lot of volume, it uh, tends to slow down with you know with the banks, and we're pretty much a one-stop shop. Thank you, Rachel. What are the current trends in lending? Current. Well, the current trends in lending right now are. Uh, gosh, that's <laughs> There's so many good trends within lending, especially for servicing uh, anyone that has a very unique situation. Banks, more so, they stick with uh, your traditional type of loan, where it's going to be maybe someone that has a 680 or higher FICO score. Uh, as well, they have uh, great income. They also have assets. Uh, great thing about a direct lender is we're able to offer down payment assistance programs. In addition, uh, not well, just for our company in particular, we offer the whole program, which is where we offer credit counseling. In addition, we help the client get through those credit challenges. And as well, we also show them how to leverage their assets and not just only get to one purchasing, one first purchase of their first home, but as well leveraging and knowing how to purchase that second home. Because of course, that first home is the most challenging home that everyone buys. Uh, so current trends going back to that as well is uh, you see a lot of millennials at this time and they're purchasing and either they may have uh, parents that can give them funds or you see the millennials that are struggling with their down payment. And going back to, as I shared about, down payment assistance programs, that'll help either cover their closing costs or they can cover their down, uh, their down payment. Thank you, Rachel. Stephen, what are the biggest misconceptions people have about entering the home buying process? Um, I think the biggest misconceptions would be down payment and FICO scores. A lot of the time people are just used to the norm, which is, you know, goes back to, a long time in lending was 20% down, and now we have programs from anywhere from 3% all the way up to you know 5, 10, 15, and 20. Obviously, after 20%, there's no mortgage insurance, but people don't understand the concept. And also, um, with us, because we service the majority of all our loans, we will go down to 580, but there are compensating factors. People just don't know this, and they always think they have bad credit, but when we run it, there are some things we can fix and help them fix, so we are able to get the credit profile up in order to get them qualified. Great, thanks, Stephen. Cosmo, how are brokers different from big banks and direct lenders? 
All right, great. So uh, first of all, I want to say whether you decide to go with a big bank or direct lender or a broker like myself, I'm sure my colleagues here and everyone else um, can help your clients get a great mortgage and also um, close your deal on time, right? Which is like the most important thing. <laughs> um, <clears throat> two years ago, I was a member here as a loan officer working for Wells Fargo. Um, I, I think that Wells Fargo was, was a great company back then, and I still think that Wells Fargo is a great company. I think it really matters on who you work with. Also, what, what does make a broker different, however, from these other banks, is the fact that brokers are able to compare rates and shop on behalf of their clients. So what does that mean? That means that we're able to get the rate at a wholesale price, which means that it's a less cost to your client, and your client ends up getting the lowest rate possible. The second thing is, as investors, we have a large pool of, um, as brokers, I'm sorry, we have a large pool of investors um, that have loan products for just about every situ situation you may come across. So that's about it. Thank you. Peter, what are some example or example scenarios that you can provide us with the difference in guidelines? Uh, so I'm pretty sure, you know, all of you guys are very, all three of you are also familiar with this as well. So some of the scenarios that uh, you know I, I know many of you are interested interested you know you know when you come to ask us you know some of the ones some of the simple ones are like what uh, they already brought up is the credit score credit score requirement uh, the credit trade lines requirement uh, with some of the lenders they will require a trade line now you know before trade line or three trade lines. Whereas for you know for us we might not have that requirement. Debt to income ratio we can go higher as high as up to fifty five percent and maybe even higher. Higher loan to value, uh, you know we can go as high as up to one hundred percent, ninety nine percent with the one percent down. Uh, document requirement past twelve month of uh, housing payment history, one year of uh, tax returns. Those are for examples. Departing residents. Uh, Currently, you know, the banks are changing with uh, guidelines on departing residents. Non-occupant co-borrowers, so we can use non-occupant occupant co-borrowers, which is huge. Uh, rental income calculation experience, um, reserve and asset requirement. Sometimes, you know, they will require two, two to six months, while some of the guidelines with Freddie Fannie doesn't require the reserves. And just use of business lines. Thank you. Rachel, what impact does a low FICO score have on a potential buyer's purchasing power? <laughs> what impact does a low FICO score have on a potential buyer's purchasing power? They cannot buy a house. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, um, for, for my company in particular, we do have a program or product where we have the lifesaver loan. And so you think of, let's give an example. Uh, there may be a hairstylist, maybe a nail technician who receives all cash. And, um, or any type of person that has an all cash business. So either they're not claiming that income on the taxes and we have a product where we don't need any documentation. So it's pretty much, I just need a FICO score. And you can have as well as a 501. Wow. Yeah. So there's no one else that, out there that's offering that. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have that one. Uh, but, but still, even at that, still, even a low FICO score, as low as a 580, we can still do an FHA loan. So as long as they have great income coming in, we can do your traditional type of FHA loan. Uh, they don't have a lot of debt, and for an FHA, we can go as high as, uh, what, maybe a, what, 49, 45, somewhere around there? Yeah, yeah, somewhere around there. Um, so those are some of the things that we're able to still offer, whereas just as I shared, what makes us uh, unique for us to be direct lenders is that we're able to offer that to some clients who have credit challenges. And so there is a loan out there, there are options out there that all of us here, all of my colleagues are able to offer to your clients. So it's just asking the questions and uh, you giving us the scenario and saying, hey, this is a client that I have, how can you, help, how can you uh, serve them? Thank you, Rachel. Steven, depository bank or mortgage bankers? Who, what, where, why, and how? Uh, um, so 
us at New American, we are a mortgage bank, which means we only practice the, the we only do mortgage loans to consumers. Uh, depository banks such as Wells Fargo and Bank of America is a depository bank where they take depositors' money and use them in mortgage practice. So because of that, they are regulated by the FDIC. So according to the guidelines of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, everything that we can do as lenders is cut back by 10 or 5% to the banks because they need to do um, a lot more low risk because they're putting the public's deposited money at risk in their practice. So as um, mortgage bankers, and we are direct delegated Fannie Freddie, we serve it to the window, we are able to go full guidelines. So with full guidelines, whatever it says, we go and we underwrite to the DU. DU is a risk assessment. So once we put in the income and the assets and everything application, we send it through this underwriting program, and that's what shoots us our conditions to underwrite. So right now what we're seeing, because there's a lot of liquidity in the market, we're seeing um, DUs come back with 20% down, no appraisal. We're seeing DUs come back at one year W-2 and one tax um, check stuff, that's it. Because it's really, it's, it's based on the risk of the file. So if they say this person has been at their job a long time, they have some assets, they've been in their home a long time, and they have some contributing factors, they will waive sometimes the two years W-2s and stuff like that. Thank Personally, you. mortgage banking. Cosmo, what's the difference between a qualified mortgage and a non-qualified mortgage? All right, great. So qualified mortgage, what is that, right? Qualified mortgage are loans that you are familiar with, which are conventional loans, FHA loans, and VA loans. Um, those loans have, are backed up by Fannie and Freddie, and they have to follow their guidelines. What are non-qualifying mortgages? Are loans that are not backed up by Freddie and Fannie, and they do not need to follow their guidelines. And some of the programs that are, that are popular right now, the bank statement program, which allows me to qualify your clients based on the cash flow shown on their bank statement, not on their taxes. The other um, good program right now that's really popular is called a Profit and Loss um, Program. I could go to your clients and ask them to provide me with a CPA letter, one year le letter from the CPA, and we could qualify them based on that CPA letter versus their taxes. Thank you. Peter, what is an FHA 203K and how will it benefit the agents? Um, I don't know if all of you guys know what's a FHA 203K? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. Somewhat? Sure. All right. So let me ask the audience this. <laughs> How has it been for you guys? I have not used one in uh, 80 years. But. 80? <laughs> you need to get updated, Caesar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can borrow the repair of a house. You can buy a property, a fixer-upper, and have some money set aside. And then once the builder finishes your upgrade, then that loan goes in to pay the builder. Is that, is that Close. 80 years ago still the same? Close. Very good. Uh, does anybody, has anybody else experienced it? No? Okay. So let me give you a scenario. So like what Caesar said is you can actually borrow more than actual your purchase price. So let's say if you have a beat, beat up home selling at $500,000, four bed, two bed, but there's a hole in the roof, right? See there? Yeah. There's a hole in the roof. How are you going to sell the house? Well, we can go with the 203K, we can get a contractor with the plan, get that fixed up. Let's say if we're going to cost additional $100,000 to complete this, pro this project, we can do the loan at $600,000 with the 3.5% down, so that would be about what, five. 580, 580-ish, and we can do that loan at 580 amount. I've seen where it's actually done up to 700,000, 720 for the full, you know, high balance conforming loan amount. I've seen it done as high as, as you know, as much. So you guys don't, if you guys are representing a seller that might have a home that is not as well conditioned, there might be foundation issues, you guys can talk to us about this 203k program where we can help you sell your house for, you know, the property of the value for a little bit more. Thank you. And to add on to that, the benefit is 
as an agent, you're selling the property, you get your commission. It closes, all of the repairs, all the financing goes after the sale of the property. And it's, uh, you still can't close within 30 to 40 days. Yes. So it's not something that's gonna drag on for six months, you know, 60, 90 days. It still can close within 60 days as long as we have the document, you know, um, the proper document for the contractor, we can close right away. Thank you. Rachel, what is, what is the biggest challenge in the lending industry? Biggest challenge in the lending industry is um, income. <laughs> it, it's a, it's an array of things. Um, I think that well, of course, there's income. Yeah, there's credit. There's assets. There there's there could be things that are are missing. So you think of lending, or you think of a purchase or a refinance or whatever the case may be. You think of a funnel. And so there's this one funnel, and so there's three things that need to go into this funnel. And that's gonna be income, that's gonna be credit, that's gonna be assets. And so one could be lacking, however, we can still try and supplement for something. So as I shared in uh, a lot of my different colleagues here as well, is that we're able to offer different things. So whether that's, okay, you know what, they're lacking in credit. How can we offer our services by either increasing their credit score? What do I need to do in order to counsel them and say, Okay, you have this many debts, hey, guess what? You have $20,000 credit cards and they're all maxed out, but you have $25,000 in the bank. We're pretty much upside down. So hey, you know what, okay, how can we fix this? Maybe we need to pay down the credit cards. And then from there, depending on their income, we can utilize the products that we have for our down payment assistance program. So there's multiple challenges, it's just more so trying to fit in where our client fits in within that. So we go through the analysis as lenders and we say, okay, what can we do in order to help this client? And as well, they, they have to have the passion in order to know about home ownership, in order to be a home owner. You know, there's a lot of clients that are out there and realtors, as you, that's your job to understand, is this person motivated or are they just, you know, shooting a breeze to you and just saying, hey, you know what, yeah, I've been thinking about owning a home, but are they really passionate about it? When you're sending them the referral for a lender and us as lenders calling those clients and saying, hey, you know, such and such gave us a referral. We said that you're interested in purchasing a home, but then we're calling the clients, but they're not motivated. So we want to make sure that that client's motivated and that we're able to help them. And there's always a way to fit in someone in some particular way. Thank you, Rachel. Steven, yes. how can buying points benefit me? Um, it depends, like some people will need to buy points in order to bring the rate down in order for them to qualify or some people are under the impression that you know if they buy points it'll be a lower payment but points are, are charged in increments of eights. So sometimes we see someone with a $400,000 mortgage and they want to buy down you know a half point. So depending on the cost of that day, let's just say it's going to cost them $6,000 to save $200 a month. So we look at the cost based on a two-year average. We will look at the what the savings are divided by two years, and if it beat out the cost. If it doesn't, it's just not cost-effective to me. But some people want to buy it down for comfort purposes. But personally, I look at it as a cost-effective measure. And if it does, it's not cost-effective to them, we advise them, and sometimes we have a problem getting it through to fund because there's a... Um, they're over the cost of the loan. So sometimes like the cost of the loan can, cannot go past 5.99%. So if they're trying to buy down two points along with all the other costs, we can't do it sometimes. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Cosmo, what's the minimum FICO score clients need to buy a home? All right, great. So uh, Rachel covered this a little bit. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so we could go as low as 500 on an FHA, um, FHA loan, FICO score as low as 500 they will have to put down 10% down in order to make that loan work. Now we could also do 580, as Rachel was mentioning earlier, and they could put down the normal 3.5% down. We also have something called credit simulation in my company. Whenever I run your client's credit, I run something that we call credit simulation, right? So that allows me to see if your client was to pay X, Y, and Z, or they were to add an extra line, what would their credit, what would their FICO be? And that can improve their pricing. So um, sometimes, you know, we, we take advantage of that to improve the pricing, sometimes we don't, but it's a great tool to have. 
Great, thank you. Well, that wraps it up for today's vendor panel. Do we have any questions for the panel? What kind of rates are available for investors, say, who want to buy a fixer up their house and not live in it, but just buy it to flip? I have a debt service ratio program. As long as you put down 20% and the future rents of it will cover the principal interest taxes and insurance, it's roughly 5.8 right now. What do you say on fix and flip? Uh, fix and flip. Well, this is an investment property. Fix and flip or investment? Both. Uh, it's, it's an investment product. We don't um, give you the funds for the fix. But as an investment property, as long as the 20%, the future rents cover the principal interest tax and insurance, we will do it at a 645 with no taxes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my question is regarding the FHA 203K. Is that available through people like Chase or Bank America or Wells Fargo? Some of the banks, some of the, um, the banks, they do have the products, but they might not be too familiar with the products because they don't, they're not, they don't, they don't direct, um, they don't sell them, pretty much. So if they're not familiar with them, so if they don't know the guidelines, they don't know how to do it, it's, it's very complex. I know Bank of America doesn't, uh, doesn't offer the 203K, uh, but I don't know if I think Wells Fargo does. I don't they, think most, uh, most of the big Wells banks Fargo do not. Offer they don't, okay. I know some of the banks, they do, but I know some, most of the reps, they do not, they're not familiar with it. So you might want to go to a special that does. So for, for example, I had a listing. Now with 70,000, I'm the listing. The buyer only 10% down was well far approved. So they couldn't, they didn't have money. After they closed, they won't have 70,000 to success. So that deal, you know, canceled. So subsequently, so, so the problem is if they have went to a mortgage broker, they may have gotten 10% down, it's okay, right? On that, yes, fine. But they didn't know. You know otherwise, there's no way to get that 70,000 from them, even after closing. Right? So right now, with the new renovation loan that we have to Fannie Mae, we take the future repair value after it's been repaired. So how much was the um, price of your listing? Oh, the price is uh, 9, 9.95. Oh, 9.95 is different. We have to stay under conforming loan limits. Well, but with, oh, I see, I see. Yeah. yeah. And the loan is definitely worth anyway. Yes. Any other question? Can you do that again? Um, you guys offer construction loans, and do you not have to pay until you're done with the project? We do not. <laughs> uh, depending on the construction type, there is a construction to perm um, type of program that's out there. Um, so we can, I mean, you can talk to us about it afterwards. We, this one, I have a, on the construction, we have a one close, which is we will include the construction costs and the land into one close. This is only through our FHA and VA channel. And the construction to perm would depend on the county loan limit. Yes, ma'am. Yes, right. Okay, earlier, uh, Steve, earlier you mentioned about mortgage insurance. Yes. And uh, my question is, how can a borrower get rid of mortgage insurance with the rising uh, house value? And what is the shortest period you have seen a borrower able to successfully uh, uh, request the removal of uh, mortgage insurance? Mortgage insurance on FHA is standard. It is not removable. Right. So you would have to refinance. Please use the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. You would have to refinance out of FHA and go into a conventional in order to remove it. And we are looking at the value of the home. It's the only way it's going to be removed. Um, for conventional, conventional mortgage insurance is risk-based. So they look at the FICO score. They look at your debt ratios. They look at how many people are on the application. And also, they look at the down payment. So sometimes if you, like once again, if you have a strong profile, a strong credit score, even at 85%, if you pay one point or two points, sometimes it'll wipe it out. So, but if you're looking to refinance and get rid of mortgage insurance, you could pay the premium to get rid of it, sometimes one or two points, or also we could build the mortgage insurance into the interest rate. It just depends on the strength of the client. So refinance is the only way to get rid of mortgage insurance? If you currently have a, a home that has mortgage insurance and it's a conventional loan, you call us the bank and we go ahead and we set out an appraisal. And then once the appraisal comes back, we look at the loan to value. And if it's under 80%, then we will remove it. So that's a request of current lender to do so? Oh, you've got to request it. Right. Yeah. And what, what is 
the shortest period a person because sometimes you buy a house and mm -hmm. you know six months later the price go, goes up so much is way your your equity you know your uh, your loan loan to ratio is mm -hmm. way below 80 percent sure but there has to be compensating factors for us to look at it after six months let's just say a renovation or something what they did to improve the property so if it's after six months and you just say, oh, my property went up 25000 or 100000 because of, you know, there has to be compensating factors for us to look at it. But you can order an appraisal anytime through us on your home and take a look at the value. <laughs> I've seen it done in two years. Yeah. Most of the lenders have, can I piggyback to that? Absolutely. Most of the lenders will uh, release, will review it after two years, um, after two years of the mortgage from the, from the note, original note date. So you can request to have it, uh, have a review and send appraisal out to see if it has fallen below 80% or that's 78%. But for the MI, the, after uh, the value has, uh, or the loan to value has been below the 78%, it is required that they do have to remove the MI as well. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Let's give one more round of applause.